So tell me what you know about Steve Madden, the actual guy. I didn't even think Steve Madden was a real guy. <laughs> I just thought like it was like a brand. Sure sells men to fashion mogul. Steve Madden is one of the biggest names here. Oh, without a doubt. With 310 stores in 76 countries, his public company is a significant player in the fashion business. I know probably nothing, actually. If we take a look at a thriving publicly traded company, the guy behind it all, one of the bluntest, least likely CEOs you're ever going to meet. Maybe it's like two guys' last names put together. I don't know. Is he from Europe, possibly? Shoemaker Steve Madden was arrested on charges of money laundering and securities fraud. Steve Madden has uh, been running for the last uh, almost 50 months out of a prison cell. Is he a he? Maybe he's a she. He could be gay, but that's all right. A little bit awkward. He definitely has some size. Maybe like white hair, but a cool white mustache, dark hair. I don't know. Maybe close to 40. The shoe is on the other foot for Steve Madden, which just released third quarter earnings that blew away estimates, and they say, you know what, we'll do it again. I know he was in that movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonah Hill, Wolf of Wall Street. Steve Madden. <laughs> Steve. Steve. Um, no, I don't know. I, I don't really know. We don't know anything about him. Right. Who the fuck is Steve Madden? I ask myself that question every day. How did my brother do this? You know, they call me a shoe mogul, so it's funny. It's kind of an illusion, the whole thing. And it's just like, this is what I have. I didn't set out to do this. And to this day, I struggle with that. You know, um, I think, what am I? Am I just a great hustler, an entrepreneur? I mean, am I a great businessman? Am I a designer? Am I an artist? I still don't know. Let's start. Nancy, get me Carla on the intercom. Yes. Hey, is Carla with you? Working at Steve is like a 24-7 job. But I think if you're really in the shoe business, then you never turn off anyway. Can we just sell this fucking shoe already? Get it done. It starts a lot of times with spotting something, a concept that he sees. If he's like, I love that shoe, I love it, I love it, I love it. If he's never seen it, you know, I've actually seen him say like, let me buy you a new pair of shoes and let me take the one off of your foot. Always on the job. Um, always, always on the grind. Well, he'll come in and he'll be excited about something like that and start talking about it and suggest a last or a material or a shape. We love this, right? Yeah. We need lots of shoes like this. So switch it to two colors. We black and a gold. And then we try to take that idea and make it a reality. You know, it's speed and product. It's how quickly we can get something made profitably and get out to our stores as quickly as possible. That's where you feel the energy. Is that, I don't think that I'm ends. making the two tones no matter what you say, so tough shit. It's a remarkable thing to be able to build right in your own office. I really don't like the two-tone there. I just don't know how she wears it. It's too much shoe. If we see something not working, we're capable of changing it around quickly. Within three or four hours that the shoe is done, somebody's taking it right to a store and putting it on a shelf. We want to see the finished product in stores. Who's buying it? Oh, look, that girl's trying it on. Who is that? How old is she? What do you think? We listen to what she's saying. We like sit there and analyze, analyze, analyze. And if we can sell eight out of 12 on a Saturday in downtown Soho, we know we have a winner. When we get something out there that doesn't hit the mark, it costs us a lot of money. Does that make any sense to anybody? I don't understand that. Right. Wait, no one move a muscle. 
Tell Rob to get his ass in here. So what happened? We had one bad shoe. Which shoe was that? Jesus. Th that is so bad that it makes me physically ill. Did you ever see anything worse in your life? What the fuck is that? Fuck the camera. Listen to me. It's like you just went into the shoe business six months ago. I swear to God, I'm like watching you. Did you no. just like enter into an internship I'm program? To learn. What are you learning? They're fucking six dollars a foot leather. How did I what know is there that? to fucking learn? How would Jesus. I know that? You had them in the store, one hundred and forty-nine dollars. I didn't know you. I mean, it's unbelievable. How many? I mean, I, I mean, it's we. Uh, you know, it's like a game. What are you looking at me for? Wait, 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 wait. What? Say it, John. What is that face for? Because I mean, they blame me that I don't. That I don't they confirm they anything. anything. No, but it, did that happen or it didn't happen? John, you also know him. We're just not behind the eight ball everywhere. Of course, I do think that that is the shoe of the year. What? Okay. I think we're getting confused here. The colors uh, outside of the gold are dog shit. So if you want to do something about it, do something about it. Rob, I hear you. You can do it. It's really tough. And then, like, eventually you get over it and you realize it's because he still gives a shit so much, you know? And so do we. Fuck it. It is what it is. Got to go back to work the next day. Big miss on, on our yes. floors. I'm just telling you. It's just not going to be 100,000. Am I better off? Oh, I get that shit out of my sight. Why is the merchant not going to be better off? Why is the merchant not going to be better off? Am I still mic'd? Yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, this is the kids. So cute. They're so fucking cute. Here it is. That's the house I grew up in. We were in the neighborhood, and I said, do you want to see where Daddy was born? They're always asking questions about that stuff. Can you get that? Isn't that awesome? Steve, as a kid, was kind of bratty. Oh, I had lovely hair. And obnoxious. Flowing locks of blondish red hair. Didn't look like it looks now, that's for sure. I grew up in Cedarhurst, Long Island. You know, in my neighborhood, it was mostly Jewish folks. I was really the only half-Jewish guy that I knew. Steve was one of the first kids I met when I moved to the neighborhood. And then the same group of kids that we met, we the same group of kids we were friends with all the way through middle school, high school, and after. Yeah, I was a bit of a pain in the ass. And yeah, I was an annoying kid. He antagonized. I'd come into town, he'd be in high school. We'd go out and play golf, and guys in front of us were too slow. He just hit the ball into them. And they start screaming at him, and he'd scream back at them. You know, I was told I was a fuck up and I was acting that out. But I knew that I had a sort of a artistic spirit for sure. But, you know, I didn't really understand it. With two parents from the depression, which they talked about all the time, I was brought up with the fear of being broke. You know, we could lose all our money. It was very prevalent in the house. My father beat it into me, you know, it's all about you know, being successful in business, and you know, the winners are the entrepreneurs. To my family, being creative was being able to fix a television set. The sort of bias against creativity, especially in my house, just wasn't nurtured, you know, or anything. It was always like, you shouldn't even go down that road. They thought it was all about hard work, you know. So in an effort to straighten me out, my dad said I had to go to work. So I got a job in a shoe store called Toulouse and worked in the basement. It was such a creative time in the shoe business when I started. Fashion explosion were the platform shoes. 
That was uh, the early 70s. There was this whole and kind of androgynous, bisexual sort of thing that was happening. It was from England. They called it glam rock. Actually, it was men that inspired the platform movement more than the women. I loved them. They were great. They were like theatrical. And I would try them out in the basement. And I wanted to see what it was like. It was like, whoa, you know, shoes. Holy smokes. I worked for a shoe store that was in that kind of family. That's where I come from. I wanted to get up on the floor and sell shoes. I just made my way up there. I didn't ask. And, you know, they were forced to keep me up there. I was a good seller. A girl would come in and you would help pick the shoes that this girl would wear every day. You were part of designing their lifestyle and their wardrobe. Totally got a rush out of it. And I got obsessed with shoes, trying to figure out why something became big, like why something became popular. I realized you could bring some creativity to the business side of things. You know, so I found something I was really good at. And then I had to let it go because I had to go to college. As he got into college and he got into, let's say, his 19, 20 years old, and I was 30 years old, we started hanging out a little together because he went to University of Miami. And I was living in Coconut Grove. Where I was from, you had to go to college. Everybody went to college. But I was a disaster there. While if you were in Florida, it's the craziest of crazy. You know, it was, it was, it was amazing. We started hanging out together, went to clubs together. I used to go visit him on Christmas vacations from college. So what was Steve like at that time? Stoned. All the time? A lot. I was having the time of something. It was pre-AIDS. Drugs everywhere. Jewelry was a cocaine spoon. I had a few kind of wild girls. Being a married guy, I would still go out every night. I'd meet a girl and... <laughs> meet a girl and do what? I don't think we should go get into that, that story. But you've, you've seen porn, right? You've seen DPs. We, uh, we had some good times. My father said I was fucking her aunt and he wouldn't tolerate it yanked my ass right out of school. It occurred to me with my attention deficit disorder, no one knew about that stuff. Instead of ADD, you would just say... Well, you were lazy, you were cognitively indolent, I mean, sloppy. Yeah. You know, they didn't know it had to do with some sort of learning disorder. Right. And that was very smart in some ways and very spaced out in some ways. You know, it's, it's hard to square it. It really hit me when I went to college. What happens is you ultimately self-medicate, and that's much more dangerous. I think a lot of people with ADD are prone to, you know, substance abuse. So I went back home, shoehorn sticking out of my pocket, back on the floor. Well, this was it. This is where I learned the shoe business, Jildor. It's a store that was founded by this guy, Jack Bienenfeld. And he was one of the greatest men I ever knew. Just the way he ran his business, the principles that he had, they were so unbelievable. Do you remember your way around it? I do, of course. Lead the way. <laughs> yes. My fundamentals today were from those two years. Working on a stool, dealing with these hysterical Jewish women from Long Island. Oi, oi, oi. We used to have a term at 34, style 34 was a bad, like a customer that was like impossible, you know? So you'd say, uh, show us, you'd say, show us style 34. That means you knew that she was bad. Don't waste your time. There were a lot of tricks that we used though. You could put a tongue pad in a shoe. Here they're stretching the foot of the boot. <laughs> they're stretching it. Shoe stores don't have this stuff anymore. I only made it to this office when I was in trouble. <laughs> so there was a woman, I sold her a pair of shoes, and I put like four pads in it to make it fit. Like, you're really supposed to put one pad in it. If you have to put four or five pads, it's not our size. Yeah. She returned the shoe like two weeks later. So Jack calls me up to his office, he goes, he holds me up his shoe, there's pads hanging from it. We don't sell shoes like this here. It's just combat pay, man. 
You mean you really learn how to sell? I see people working hard at retail today, and I know it's the hardest work. It's so fucking hard. I really tip my hat to them. So you know what's really cool? The velvet ones. Yeah. Do you have the velvet, too? I like the velvet. I'm really into that. The velvet? Well, I just want you to see it. I like the velvet one. I love. That's my favorite shoe. Good salesman. I am. I used to work here. Oh, really? A long time ago, yeah. Oh. Get them the shoes, will you, before they walk out? I dig it. I like that a lot. And also, this is cute, too, for her. She may not be ready for that. All the guys my age were going into the city and, you know, working in the garment center or working as stockbrokers or whatever and, you know, getting on the railroad. It was like a, you know, and I, here I was in the town, like, you know, stuck in the town. <laughs> but anyway, it was time to get into the city. I was ready. I got this great job, a great opportunity at LJ Simone. It was a tiny little company. I got to do every job in the shoe business, from shipping shoes to designing shoes, selling shoes, obviously. It was a great experience. So I moved to the city, and, you know, it was everything I thought it would be. It blew my mind. Just be blown away by this wave of energy. And the village was where I belonged my whole life. You know, everybody's a bit demented, you know? I'm a bit demented, so I fit right in. These are my friends. That's Alan Smith, that's Brian Frank, and that's Danny Porsche. Look at that hair. Strawberry blonde hair. We had a lot of fun. Go to the clubs, get high, go try and find girls. Club scene was going, and I think it was post Studio 54. It was an amazing time. It was the early 80s. I would work like crazy and then get blasted. A lot of cocaine, and cocaine was a terrible drug. All this stuff, and you just grind your teeth, and sweat, and keep taking more. <laughs> you know, and it led me to other things, too. I think our crew is more quaalude than cocaine. Let's talk about a quaalude for a second. When you first took it, you got this tingle all over your body and you instantly loved everybody. There was really nothing I've ever experienced anything like it in my life. And some of us got in trouble with it and I got in trouble with it. I was a doorman at his building. I used to do the night shift from 12 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning. And one morning I met him but he was naked. He used to be like a wild druggie doing like quaaludes and coke and stuff. And he told me one time he was so high on quaaludes that when he went to sleep, he had woken up, but he wasn't in his bed. He had woken up and he was nude in the hallway. For some reason, he got locked out. And he didn't know what to do, so he just, he went, he pushed the elevator, went down to the lobby, just held his little thing, walked up and said, I need the key to the room. <laughs> so I gotta go with the master key note. Yeah. And I was always like, that's the guy I want to hang out with. Hello, this is Howard Cosell talking about Brian's wedding. Can't see a goddamn thing that eyes in my eyes. I know Brian 20 years. He was a louse then, he's a louse now. He was uncontrollably high. He would fall on his face. He'd be face down a lot of places. Magnanimous friends, smoke in my face. His zeal for things has been his success, but also his downfall. Because he went with that same zeal with the drugs and alcohol. So he was, he wasn't like a weekend warrior, you know. That wasn't it. He was a full-time barbarian. And then Steve just kind of slipped and he couldn't get his legs under him. He used to hang out really late. Nice girls, nice girls used to go up to his room. One day, I think he was so high and he passed out and then the, the girl came down. He's dead, he's dead. Crazy those days. I had like five Dewey's and I lost my license. We can't help him. This is bigger than us. 
Was there a specific point that you realized that you were an addict? Well, I didn't. I sort of knew after a while. People use the word party. You know, your partying days. I didn't really have much of a party. You know, I was alone getting blasted. That was my party. That's where it took me, you know. You get this substance in your body and you can't stop doing it. And that's what it is. And then there are other people that have a drink or two or not, or they don't think about it and life goes on and, you know, but that's not the case for the alcoholic addict. Which is why I had to get sober. You know, when you're miserable enough, you know, perhaps you can change. I used to go and hang out with a lot of people with the same kind of problem, disease or whatever, you know, substance abuse, whatever they call it. I think uh, the drugs and the alcohol just diminished him as a person, you know, as a, as a, as a thinker, as a personality, and uh, his sobriety suited him well. He really uh, just took off, you know, as himself. Yeah, it was fresh. It was like being reborn. Your whole life changes, you know. I was ready to do my own thing, you know? I worked for L.J. Simone for eight years. I just, you know, I quit one day and went to work in my own business. And uh, I was like, what did I just do? <laughs> Am I crazy? One morning, he saw me, you know, getting in my car. He saw the red car and he asked me, uh, do you want to work for me as a driver during the day? Um, what the hell? Let me go with the steam matter. Put $1,100 in the bank and we started. I made the shoes in, believe it or not, it was a little garage in the building I'm at now. I would design and sell it. Nothing matters until you sell it. And then I made a little shoe called the Marilyn. It was just a little slide. And if you wore it under jeans, it looked like a boot, but it really was backless. It was what they call a mule. Closed toe, open back shoe. Marilyn, we used to sell everywhere, everywhere. He liked country music. He used to sing in the car. When he was crazy about one shoe, he used to put it in the dashboard feel the shoe, feel the leather, smell it. And uh, he said, this, David, this is going to be a home run. I'm looking for inspiration. It's not so much the pair of shoes. It's how they're wearing it. I can tell if it's a hit or not. I can almost tell by, from the way they walk how good it is. I sold to anybody I could. Shoe stores, department stores, clothing stores. I was really doing everything that this little red car. It basically, yeah, that was our office. Cash flow is so important in a business. I mean, even when you're starting out, it, you know, you can't have like 25 cents less than what you need. And you have to manage that. Got this call from Danny. You know, he was my childhood pal. Danny said, we're looking for companies to raise money for. Like, dude, we'll raise you the money you need to build a business. I didn't really believe him. It was so far-fetched. He said he's got this, this genius behind his company named Jordan. He's the mastermind. Jordan Belfort. Jordan Belfort. Jordan Belfort, the wolf of Wall Street, was a product of the bull market of the 90s. The times were ripe for guys like Belfort and Porsche. Early 90s, it was rah-rah on Wall Street. Young people opening up brokerage houses. What's come to be known as this boiler room era of stock brokerage houses. There's a lot of guys here that are cold calling right now. In a few months, you could be making a lot of money. And Jordan created this aura about him. His guys were just in awe of him. 
he was able to take industry outsiders, high school dropouts, and near overnight, turn them into million dollar sales machines. They were drinkers and druggies, and they really had this great Long Island party lifestyle. And what these guys presented to the entrepreneur was so intoxicating. See, the Stratton guys were like on yachts that fucking whacked. And it was the cult of Jordan. They certainly captured that on the film, The Wolf of Wall Street. Nobody's ever done what they did. The girls and the, the drugs, Sodom and Gomorrah. And all this money, gym bags full of cash, millions of dollars getting passed back and forth. I mean, there was a crazy lifestyle. And I was sober when that was happening, watching it. I never know what, what was going on inside. If I knew it, I would go into it. <laughs> I did what I had to do. We needed that liftoff. So we took the money and we really did use it. And we built a business with it. This is my first store, and those signs is one of my village guys. He painted them, we put them on the outside of the store. That shoe was the first shoe I sold in this store. No one was down here. And um, what'd you guys get at Top Shop? What'd you guys, no shoes, clothes? We came here for shoes. Oh, okay, good. So I had the store in the front and the office in the back. Yeah, I was trying to like get every nickel out of it. And I had it in my mind that I wanted a store and I thought it would be good for the brand. But I had no idea what I was doing. When I started, it was just Steve and I. We sat across the desk from each other. We had an office the size of this room. I answered phones, I did customer service. I was the only one that did anything, you know, with the billing and the shipping. So if I wasn't there, it wasn't getting done. She would do anything and People liked her and she understood what I was doing. We started with the total four employees, Steve, Wendy, David Cristobal, and myself. I was so lucky to find this man. He organized the financials and I paid attention to the shoes and we are so not alike. This is the call of Mahalakshmi, the goddess, a goddess of money. When I opened this building and I mocked the religious things here, and that's where I put the statue of the goddess, which bring the success of the company. I wasn't frivolous with the money at all. You know, as soon as I got it, it was just like, sell more shoes, hire more people. A real firm was taking shape. In the beginning, we really weren't structured at all. There was a lot of juggling, as always, which is normal here. Because it was so small and growing and unprofessional, that was the craziness. We would have like rat droppings all over the computers. Remember that? And then he would try to get me to bring my kittens to get rid of the rats. You know, I was an outsider when I started, right? So there's like a, in every business, there's like the establishment and then there's the newcomers. I sort of relish that. I sort of, I really like that. You know, in the 90s, it was a time when there were great American designers, but it was very elitist. Steve, to the more high fashion, people might be a little bit, you know, like a, the hillbilly cousin. Both the fashion industry and I think just the media industry at the time did not take teenagers seriously. It was Vogue tells you what to wear and what not to wear, Harper's Bazaar tells you what to wear and what not to wear. Sassy magazine was kind of an anomaly, right, in the magazine world. Seriously, we were not a fashion magazine. The only people who took us seriously were like the cool indie people, thank God. The 90s were kind of a coming together 
time of fashion and music. It's almost the way like grunge was big back in the 90s when we first started. Shoes had a more masculine look to them. They were a little bit rougher and tougher. And it's because of that whole grunge phase that music went through. So our inspiration really starts from there. And Steve really is very music focused. Like the music business, it's not enough to just make a record that is great that no one buys. I knew that I had to come up with a hit in order to make it. And then I made a little Mary Jane. We called it the Mary Lou. Made a shoe that was for a market that wasn't being served. It was truly young fashion. The field was sort of empty. This was a, a big look. It was a very baby doll, little girl kind of a sexy thing. Historically, you would have had the luxury high-end designers and then the lower price point brands, and they would have been completely separate. Steve Madden was the first person to democratize on-trend shoes. He's the grandfather of this whole movement. To me, it was like he was giving people who didn't have the chance to wear all the stuff that was being dictated to them. If you don't have this, you're a loser. He wanted to make sure that fashionable shoes were also affordable for the real girl customers who wanted to look great too. That's particularly something that the fashion establishment is super duper touchy about. I'd even ask him, like, how come you never in Vogue, Bazaar, L, all these things? And he's like, those people hate me. It was an older industry. We sort of disrupted it. This is the shoe that was made famous in the Wolf of Wall Street. The Mary Lou, I have the, the Mary Jane is followed by the, the kid. Hoffman played me, he did a good job. John, we're gonna cut in the lobby, I caught a genius. Okay. Enter Steve Madden. Great American cop. Red hot ladies footwear impresario. And thanks to Donnie, we were taking his company public. Danny said, it was time to go public. You gotta go talk to the brokers. You gotta tell them your story. We'll get them all pumped up and it'll be great. And that's what I did. And that's that famous scene. That's why they got to see your face. You get them fired up so they push the shit out of this stock, OK? Like, our job was to get them worked up. It's, it's like amazing how they got this stuff. It was pretty accurate. You know, that Jonah Hill playing Danny and DiCaprio good. playing Belfort. They did an amazing job. Hello? I don't know if I was that dorky. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Steve Madden. Yeah, we know who you are. Your name is on the box. Show him the shoe. Show him the shoe. Show him the shoe. OK, yeah. Anyway, you know, this, this shoe this is pretty cool. This is the Mary Lou, which is really the shoe that put me on the map. Without it, I wouldn't be here. Believe it or not, though, the Mary Lou is actually the same as the Mary Jane, but it's black leather. You know, I was talking about shoes, and these guys just went crazy. They were heckling me. You know, you got like 500 animals heckling me. Let's give it up for Steve Madden and his awesome Mary Lou. Hold that up. Hold Jordan that up. was amazing. They were just, he was like, you know, like a dictator, all-knowing leader of a country. I want you to ram Steve Madden's stock down your clients' throats till they fucking choke on it. Yeah. Yeah. Till they choke on it and they buy 100,000 shares. That's what I want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be ferocious. Yeah. You'd be relentless. Yeah. You'd be telephone fucking terrorist. Yeah. Now let's knock this motherfucker out of the park. Yeah. And at the time it went public, I think he had one store in Soho. I mean, that's not a business, typically, that anybody takes public. That's a Stratton Oakmont Hallmark. So I'm talking to my brother on the phone. Stock was coming out at four dollars, and it goes from four dollars to eighteen dollars in about an hour and a half. What? I've never seen anything like this in my life. I want to know where this is coming from. Twenty-two billion dollars in three fucking hours! <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> I can't tell you how much I have to thank Danny. He really took the reins this year and made a huge success. And it was like, holy smokes, this is insane, real money. I went from an eviction notice to a private jet in like 200 days. 
which is crazy. So I had to play ball with these guys. Donnie and I secretly owned 85% of Steve Madden shoes, which legally speaking was a big no-no, but we'd get filthy fucking rich if our troops got behind it. Sometimes they would do some transactions in his name, but the transactions were really for themselves. You know, they're buying and selling it for me, so how could it be illegal? You know, I became part of the scheme. Because I didn't care about anything but building the business. Oof, no. This is really cute. Here, could you put this on? I love this. That's a great shoe. I think that this could be the next big, really big sandal for us. Look at that. You know why? Because it's got taste and style. And it's, it's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> it's tasteful. God forbid we should make a tasteful shoe. Fashion was moving at such a fast pace. And our biggest goal of the day would be, how much higher do you think we could make this heel? How much higher do you think we could make this platform before Steve, like, kills us? There were some crazy shoes. I mean, some crazy platforms. You know, kind of the gender-bending shoes of 70s rock stars. It was a very exciting time, and, and we've, as a matter of fact, we've taken a lot of those things from that era and made them now in our company. It's an instinct. You know, you wake up in the morning and you don't have it in your closet, so you come in and try and make it. This is pretty much if we're looking for it, somebody else is too. He had this incredible system of test and react, which was exactly what we tried to do in the record business. Madden's New York headquarters features a sample factory where new ideas are cobbled by hand. He found he could develop a prototype and sell a small test run in his own stores before deciding if it was right for the mass market. If they reacted, he then would go and order them in big bulk, and that would eliminate the issue of getting product back because he already knew that he had it hit. These shoes can be there first before everybody else. Though many times smaller, Madden's edge over competitors like Nine West is speed to market. Little by little, people started paying more and more attention to what he was doing. I got very interested in Steve um, with those funny fashion ads of the big heads and the little skinny, sexy body and the big shoes. We wanted to do something that wasn't like other fashion companies with the beautiful girls and the poses, so we did something a little unique. There was nothing, nothing, nothing like it. So it was instant. The second went up, boom. Subject of many uh, discussions because it's somewhat controversial. The fact that we were making them look like little hookers, you know, I was like, these parents have to be upset. But, you know, he was like, no, you know, I'm, I know what I'm doing. Anti-fashion is what it was. It kept him in a separate place, identity-wise, actually built his identity. It definitely was a, one of the more memorable campaigns of the time. Throughout the 90s, they would, you know, they were the talk of the town. First things first, this shoe on the wedge we're going to make, and we're going to sell this to every store in America. It's fantastic. I remember he had some monster shoes big bottom shoes. And then he got a shoe called the Slinky. And the Slinky was huge. I'm just picturing girls in leggings, shuffling around with maybe like a fun yeah. toenail polish. Like they were everywhere. All of a sudden, every girl I spoke to knew who Steve Madden was. I was like, wow, how did this happen? It's so amazing. Steve Madden, the number one man for making the dopest shoes on the planet. I watched from afar how Steve built up this incredible business. I mean, I, I like everybody else, said, wait a second, this is Steve United. I felt like I could do anything. You know, that we were like this force that was quicker and smarter than the other armies. Tonight, knowing what your customers want before the competition does. Former stock boy turned self-proclaimed shoe warrior. Then Steve Madden has no intention of slowing down. His retail stores average $1,000 in annual sales per square foot, double the usual turnover for stores their size. I own my own shoe store. Steve used to come every single weekend, and he bought the store, and then I guess in turn bought me. They never gave him a discount, just so you know. Hot shoes have helped Madden's sales shoot from $5 million in 1993 
to an estimated $83 million last year. Revenue streaking from $59 million to $163 million between 1997 and 1999, and profits more than tripling in that same time period. I needed to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, because that's what you do. Those kind of profits, it was another kind of drug. We were just moving so quickly, and it's like he became a little bit of a rock star. Like, people come up to him and like, oh, can I have your autograph, can I this? And I tease him, and I go, oh, ooh, Steve, you're such a rock star. And he's like, leave me alone, let me enjoy my moment. It's my moment. Christina's and Britney's and Janet Jackson's all wear our shoes. The man of the evening, Mr. Steve Madden! You know, that old Andy Warhol, 15 minutes of fame, that we're up to about six hours now. There are obviously natural concerns that the company might become really too dependent on one guy, that being you. What happens to the company, God help us, if Steve Madden walks out here on Broadway and gets hit by a bus? <laughs> <laughs> Gloom and doom. Bad stuff, right? That's bad stuff. Um, we're f Last year, he did pay more than $4 million to former Stratton Oakmont execs to settle claims stemming from his association with the outfit. I wanted to put that part of the, of the company's history behind us and paid those guys off and moved on. The shenanigans with those guys had ended in the middle of the 90s. And then the company went on to just be explosive. I had this like amazing, you know, company, but all the while I know my past is going to rear its ugly head at any moment. When the first wave of the Stratton guys were, were arrested, my, my mom called me from Boca, and she said, I heard they're talking. Mr. Dan Porish and Jordan Belfort have pleaded guilty to a variety of securities fraud. There have been persistent concerns, Steve, that federal investigations into their activities might become a federal investigation into you. Uh, any thought, any truth to those? No, Is there any I reason mean, for the concern? No, they, they took us public, and uh, but uh, we don't think that we'll be tainted by that brush. Your mind is telling you one thing, but inside, internally, you know, you know that something is not quite right. And then the whole thing came crashing down. And there was nothing I could do at that point. I'll let you take a picture. Relax. Thanks, man. Relax, guys. You can take a picture. I'm not hiding. Relax. There was a story that said that Steve Madden was going to be indicted. The flamboyant CEO surrendered to federal authorities facing multiple charges of conspiracy, securities fraud, and money laundering from manipulating 22 initial public offerings, including his own company, allegedly making illegal gains of $7 million. Belfort says that Madden acted as his front selling shares on his command and giving him a big cut of the profits. But at least Madden's company was real. The headline grabbing person was Steve. Jordan Belfort wasn't famous before he committed his crimes, whereas Steve was already a really well-known person, and therefore it's more valuable. Charges could have called for as much as 25 years, federal prison. Steve, do you have any comments about um, charges? Yeah, hope against hope that it's going to go away, or that they'll have bigger fish to fry, or, you know. You're going to sometimes dance between the raindrops and not get wet. OK, what about the fact that there are four people with the other uh, companies who have already said that you, in fact, did that? The world is falling down on you. You don't know what you're doing. I mean, you're just like, you're just trying to get through that day, you know? Are you worried this is going to affect your business? No. So, Steve, what do you do now? Where do you go from here? No comment, OK? They wanted him to wear a wire against people that he knew for years, friends, to try to implicate them, and he wouldn't do it. Even though that I, I wasn't a snitch, I certainly look back and have maybe some understanding of the guys that did tell, uh, because they really, they can they can torture you. The government was very tough. Thank you very much. Wore me out. You know, it was just like the constant 
court going back and forth, and uh, it led to a relapse. I just threw in the towel and started getting loaded again. We went back to court at some future date and sentenced Steve to 41 months. It was devastating to him. Before he went away and we had a sales meeting out on the Hamptons, and it was about 20 of us. It was just a good feeling that he knew that there are people behind him. It sucked. Yeah, it was it's scary. <laughs> it sucked. We didn't I mean... know what was going to happen. I had this great family of, that I was building, this great company. And I thought at the time, you know what? I may not have a family, children, because I've got this family here. I know it's different, but they were like a family. Steve took the biggest sacrifice for the company. Hands down. He did what it took for the company to survive. And in doing that, he took a massive hit personally. And then the next day, he was gone. Boom, you there? And bam, it all changes. My greatest fear was going to prison, and I did go to prison. So my greatest fear became realized. It was worse than I thought. Handcuff you, and you have to change into like an orange jumpsuit and strip search you and stick glove up your ass and all this crazy stuff. It was really bad. And I got up on the bunk in the top bunk, and I looked up at the ceiling. And I said, how am I going to do this shit? How am I going to survive this? I wasn't pissed. I was sad. It was just the heartbreak of life going on outside, and you were just dead. You know, the world was moving on. People were just living their lives, and you were just stuck. Met Steve in lockup. He walks up to me just like out of nowhere, says, how is it out there? First of all, I was like, whoa, back up. So he was like, yeah, my bad. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. So he was like, oh. Uh, how is it? I said, it's cool, it's straight. I said, it's, yeah, I said, you all right. Come to find out, we was roommates. My job wasn't to make shoes. My job was to get through this. Our sales started plummeting. We, like, had meetings on our own. Mm -hmm. And was like, all right, how are we going to make... How are you make, handling this? Yeah, how are we mm -hmm. going to change this? How quickly can we get dress shoes? And keep hitting it and to make sure that, you know, we nailed the right style. And we just kept struggling. The ball dropped, the rural stops. That rural out there is no longer yours anymore, you know? So you got to get content with what's going on in there, you know? Everybody used to call me Big Swole. Swole, that's Swole, Big Swole. That's why a lot of people on the compound used to want to know me. I was probably one of the strongest people on the compound. He introduced himself to me. We talked a little bit, you know? He kept saying, Steve Madden, Steve Madden. I'm like, okay, yeah, I never heard of Steve, man. He's like, man, I, I, I'm the shoe guy. One time, he was actually waiting on me, <laughs> sitting on my bed. And I said, hey, man, you know the prison room by a man sitting on a man's bed, right? <laughs> He's like, no, what is it? If you sit on a man's bed, you, the, you want to be his girlfriend. <laughs> He's like, no. I said, okay, just sit in the chair, right? <laughs> I met a lot of great guys. Guys who fucked up, you know, but we're good guys. You know, he adapted that, and you know, he learned all the little slang lingo, because he was into that. He just wanted to learn everything. Boy, he was a character. <laughs> I just like being around them, and I like their energy, and, and they were very hopeful, a lot of guys, you know? There was a big thing about running the business from prison. Like, he's really running the business from prison, which is crazy. You can't run a business from prison. And that's how I got the job here. I don't know if we should put this on tape or not. And he said, you know what? What I'm thinking is, why don't you come to work for me? You can use my office. You can use my secretary. And come see me and tell me what's going on at work. And he said, I got the perfect, perfect position for you. So what's that? 
He said, I'm going to make you the head of international sales. I said, that's great. That's great. Why are you doing that? He says, because we don't have any international sales. You cannot fuck it up. You don't know anything about shoes. And so you can't screw it up. So that's what, so you're in charge of that. You can't run a business from prison. People can talk to you about business, but my business, you have to create, you have to make shoes, you have to talk to people. You can't do that. So I thought, well, let's give him something to talk about. When Steven's in jail, I used to get requests from the marketing people. They're like, Steve wants to know if you could hide little messages, like his jail cell number in the ad. It's kind of inspired by Sergeant Pepper. Or the Beatles used to do stuff like that. They would put like a secret message in. You know, so I decided to give a shout out to these people that I was with and these great guys. Once we did this big ad where there was a, it was like a Ferris wheels and stuff, like a Coney Island shot. And we had to put in like the hot dog vendor, this guy, like every little thing in there was some guy who was some prison cellmate. He brought me the magazine. He said, look, man, I said, man, anybody can put somebody in a magazine. That don't make you famous. You know, they just make you got a couple of dollars, you know, to put you. He's like, no, man, I'm telling you, I'm famous. I'm famous. Now you see this? F-R-E-E -E Steve. Free Steve. I said, keep him in jail. Don't free his ass. I said, listen, I don't care how much money you have. Right now, you in here. So you have zero dollars, just like everybody else. See, I ran a store inside the prison. Everything the commissary had, I had it. Yeah, mackerel was the currency. A mackerel, fish, you know, that was the currency in prison. They're delicious. I mean, you know, for somebody in prison, they're delicious. It's not like, you know, lobster. I mean, I had people all from other dorms coming to see head. He's like, man. These guys, you know, this is amazing. They gave me some pointers. He made me think of ways that I can expand. And it worked out. So I had to figure out how could I corner the market on mackerel. So I figured it out, and I ended up with hundreds of mackerel. Guy would bring me cereal from the kitchen. I'd give him a mackerel. If I wanted to get my laundry done, I paid a guy a mackerel. I became the mackerel king. Steve started teaching a class. So I taught a little business class, you know, tried to reach out to some of the guys there. They had standing room only because, you know, everybody came to this class. That's what I was really trying to, to tell them. Like, you guys that are here, you probably were successful dealing crack or whatever it was. So take that entrepreneurial skill, find a product that's legal, and sell it. And you could do it. You guys are all smart. And most of them were very smart. Very smart guys. You know, when you're in prison, man, you know, you, you, you want somebody to be there. You understand? You, you want somebody to be in your corner. So, you know, and you know, once you've been gone for so long, friends tend to fade off, you know, money begins to slow down. So you have to do what you have to do. You have to take care of yourself. You have a collect call from? Steve Madden. Can you hear me? An inmate at Coleman Correctional Facility. Do you accept the charges? I got a call from someone saying that Steve wants to see you this weekend, and I had no idea why he would want to see me. That's when I realized I'd never been alone with him before. Yeah, you know, we liked each other. We always liked each other, you know? We always got a kick out of each other, so it was that. She had a nice countenance, a face to the world, you know? She came to see him a lot. You know, in the, in the federal facilities, it's visit five days a week. Out of the five, she was there maybe three. That's a lot. You know, flying from New York. I remember when he kissed me the first time ever. In the cafeteria, the vending machines on the side, the families visiting, and it was so scary. I wanted to run, <laughs> but I was in prison. Then I get a letter on the top 10 reasons why the kiss meant nothing. And I just laughed at it because I saw what it meant. He was scared. But he was like, man, why am I starting to develop feelings for Wendy? I said, oh, come on, lad. You probably just horny, man. <laughs> 
he did throw something out there about, I don't know, maybe, maybe Wendy might be the one. When he proposed to me, it was kind of like he stuttered it out and a story about wanting to spend the rest of his life with me. And he goes, I guess what I'm asking you is to marry me. I said, yes. Many times I look back and I'm grateful for that moment and think, well, you know, if I wasn't in prison, I wouldn't have had that moment. Of course, I could have done 20 days and had that moment on the 15th day. And that would have been good. <laughs> God. <laughs> and then I married him. That's so crazy. <laughs> Such a joy to be out. It was an amazing period in my life. I got married and had a family. I just thought maybe, you know, in my line of work, people would forgive and forget. And I'd be able to move on, you know, and um, get a second chance. I had a sense that, oh my God, I'm free to do this. Let's not squander it. Wendy on my side was very helpful. I just thought, I'll get back to work and we'll see what happens. And th is this one of the new ones? That one? No. What happened to that shoe? It died. But I did fear being out of touch with the styles and not being able to put my finger on the winners because so much of styling and design is context, you know? So I was out. He said to me, it's going to take me some time to get back into it. There was a shift happening. Styling changed. We went from... Which he predicted, by yeah, the way. He told really that young, that chunkier and younger, junior-type shoes. It was becoming more dressy. Pointing to something that Steve Madden, we haven't done. When you would see young Hollywood wearing a $2,000 shoe, Real America wants to look at the same time. The shoes are not selling like they were. They would canceled a ton of shoes. They just told me. They just canceled a lot of shoes, yeah. And that's how I know, I mean, because it's not my look. So I don't have a feel for that. I know it's fabulous. You know, I know it sells like crazy, but... And then you think, well... God, I'm not creative at all. What have I done? <laughs> what have I done? I don't know anything. I'm just talking, you know? And then you figure out a way to put it all together, you know? He went back to his old tricks of just, like, what, what's she wearing? You know, what's happening on the street? The reality is, if you're a true shoe guy, um, all you do is look at feet. You know, looking at their shoes, you know, where'd you get them? Everything's about shoes, 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 shoes. I heard the other day he was in Nordstrom's for two days, sitting on a couch, you know, watching the people um, buy the shoes. That's his system, he likes that. When we're in stores and Steve walks up to women and just starts talking to them about their shoes, they're all like, who is this guy? This is my store. He goes, you know, when I was young, they thought it was cool, like I was hidden on them. Thank you. Now they just think I'm a creepy old man. <laughs> the shoe is beautiful. I haven't seen sports shoes like that in a long time. There's a lot of designers in the world that are really good at what they do, but they sort of sit and draw it and wait for somebody to, and we're hands on. He's digging it up. We're back here trying to hammer it together. All right, that's good, that's good. All right, Sally Ford. All the buyers wanted the shoes. The reputation was that Steve couldn't miss. I've created a lot of shoes, but I'm more of like an executive producer. I'm thinking about it all the way through to the end. You know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna sell it, it's gonna sit here. How am I gonna make it? What am I gonna make it for? How am I gonna make it so a lot of girls can buy it? And I'm gonna make money. It's like a personal war, each shoe, you know, almost, for it to merge and become Number one, self-esteem wrapped up in every shoe or something. 
New shoes um, are on the dashboard of the car, on the kitchen table, on the bed. When I see him so obsessed with a shoe, I have taken the shoe and put it on the pillow at night to be like, here's your shoe. And he thinks about it 100% of his, of his life. Here's what we're doing. A couple of things. This I didn't love on. This might be worth a test, since I think they're too cheap. But on something like this, a casual item, you got to be very price sensitive. FYI, that's my experience in the market. Yeah, they're amazing. The entrepreneur is a hard driver. You know, he's like, look, we're on this mission. There may be some casualties here. Where the fuck are you? No, 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 you can't do this. I'm on a fucking tight schedule. I believe it's some sort of neurotic drive. You know, there were a lot of people taking vacations when I wasn't. I thought maybe when he got married and had kids, I wouldn't be hearing from him on a Saturday and Sunday so often. Now I hear from him more. Hey, Jackie. How's my boy? How's my boy? OK. Always trying to evolve and get better. And you know, I want to be a good, a better father. That's important to me now, like be a better husband. Those are two goals that I have. I'm a very selfish, self-centered guy. And it's a struggle for me. I don't know how he does everything that he does between building this business, family, and himself. That's a whole other thing. Parenting. Wow. I, I don't even know what to say about it. It was different from my family at work. I need Chrissy. And I need Amelia. Let's start. I have to say, one of the great things is picking people to help you with the journey. So I was Ben, being a director or officer of a corporation. We hired this kid in banking, young neophyte named Ed Rosenfeld. The board had decided to make a change with the old CEO and that I was going to be the new interim CEO. My first reaction was, what, who? <laughs> Wall Street loved him because he spoke their language. Steve was neither an officer nor a director, and he was able to devote all of his time to product. Your namesake, Steve Madden, he's still a contributing designer, consultant. What does he do? Oh, yeah, he's the chief designer, and he leads everything we do from a creative standpoint. And he's, uh, he and his team are, are the ones who deserve the credit. So as the CEO, he started to put our money that we were making to good use. We have 57 locations now around the Far East. Whereas one year and two months ago, we had zero. My brother was from the new school, even though he was my older brother. He understood, like, entertaining clients. He didn't really give a shit about expenses. The most expensive bottles of champagne. And we would, we would just get the bills and freak out. <laughs> but he was like, no, this is what I'm doing. I'm bringing you a country, you idiots. Uh, UK we're starting in, Europe we're starting in, South Africa, South America, China, Japan, Israel, Australia, they love it. So now the financial acumen caught up with the creative acumen, doing deals to supplement the creative energy. We started acquiring companies. You know, usually just big companies bought, you know, buy companies. You know, like, we're making shoes for teenagers, now we're buying companies his understanding of the music industry and his understanding of what what's happening in trends outside of what's happening in footwear that resonates with so many people and allows him a, i think a tremendous runway we're able to take the old school hot shoe and marry it with the new sort of marketing procedures today hi we were talking to iggy about doing some shoes yep. what happened i've been like... waiting to get you in a room so i, I know hostage. Uh -oh. Oh, how's it going? Pretty well. I love the stuff you did with Iggy. Yeah. It's oh cool. Goodness. She's one of my good friends. Well, we know. For Steve, his designs, his influence, his energy is based on, on music. So when he wants to connect with an artist, it's different. It's very personal. Hello. Steve? Yes. It's real. I kissed the shoe. And I liked it. I liked it. As that 13-year-old, it was 20 years ago when he started, 
is now 33. He still has her. I love them. He has kind of defined how to bring fashion to the market. You got the king right here. He's the king. Ah. <laughs> He's the king. He is the king. You know that. You damn guys, you blindsided us. <laughs> If he's not on the street, he's with the buyer. Or he's talking to somebody that knows somebody that can help him get that shoe into another door. It's like he's got this underground network where he just figures out how to get things rolling. Did you guys grow up wearing my shoes? Everyone grew up you wearing your shoes. It's a gateway shoe drug, you know? Yeah. Before you get your Louboutins, you got to wear Steve Mann. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. I would like to be known as a guy who did all of that stuff. Not just, oh, he was the business guy, he was the shoe guy. I was both. I was a shoe and a business guy. And I'm still not done yet. You guys need to do a wide shot to show how massive the Steve Madden booth is. It's like from there, then it goes all the way there. It's all Steve, you understand? So to come from where he come from, the weather, the storm, and now look at him. That's why I love Steve, because he got federally indicted. So we have like a, a weird kinship, because they indicted me on money laundering. I was facing 20 years. But when he talks about that part of his life, I understand 100%. For people who don't know, Steve Madden, the founder, uh, served a prison sentence, and now he contributes in, in a very, you know, important way. You know, we'd like to be a power of example, if we could, to guys that made mistakes. There's things that, that we support, and uh, the Doe Fund is one of them, Defy is another. That's uh, so, for guys recently incarcerated, they get out, you put them yeah. to work, a lot of jobs. We actually Absolutely. see them in this neighborhood. I think, yeah. that's, up. I think that's amazing that you do that. There's a chance, there's second chances. The great thing about America. I didn't look for Steve. That man was looking for me, about a year or something. And I went to see him at a PA, and everybody was around him. And he stopped the PA, he jumped up, gave me a big hug. He said, I told you I was famous. <laughs> How you doing? All right. Today. So we're getting it all set up? Yeah, yeah. Good. He was like, hey, man, what you want to do? You want to work? You want to do something? You know what I mean? He was still that same guy. So I'm standing on the side, so people don't realize that I'm with him. Guy walk up to me. See, look at him, man. He thinks he's all that, you know, all the money. He just signing, throwing things around him. He think, oh, he's a big shot. I say, you don't even know this guy. And I'm going to tell you, I know him personally. He's not close to any of those you just said. And you don't try to please people, you know, because you never will. There's a part of me that doesn't believe that I'm really that good, you know. You know, there's an element of being a fraud, you know. And so I'm always waiting for that moment where, ah, see, I knew I was shit. And now I failed, you know, it's that thing. So I'm so afraid of that. You're never enough, you know, that kind of bit. That's why I'm moved by the need to grind and the need to earn all the time. My work and my life are one. It's, it's, you can't separate them. I don't think any entrepreneur can separate them. Like, who can we hire to do that? Like, we gotta figure it out. You get Everything is now. about the project. Everything is about the struggle. You know, just what you're trying to do, there's nothing more important than that. That's it. And I've felt that way so many times. My son would say, why, Daddy, why do you have to work so much? Well, I have to pay for clothes and the food that we eat. This is what daddy does for a living. And I wanted him to understand work, what work is all about. But the truth is, I love the work. So dad loves the work. And now that I'm getting older, I'm 58 now, you know, I'm thinking, why do I keep pushing myself? And it's because I want to win. You take on the responsibility right along with him. You want it to succeed, same way he does. And it's hard, because you lose friends, relationships go to shit, because it's like, this becomes your priority. Sometimes I'm like, oh my god, I have kids. That's right. <laughs>
Can I say this, that it was great to have Steve in prison? It was the only time, maybe even to this day, that, you know, I got his full attention. It was a different Steve. When he was in this environment, you know, he didn't see what was right there. He was never planning on getting married his whole life. When it all costs, there are costs, you know. I'm not proud of it. It's really taken its toll on me. I have to say, it's changed me. You know, you're just like, what the hell am I doing this for? What am, what's happening here? So I'm thinking about my life other than shoes, you know? A lot of loss, a lot of loss along the way. But you know, that's that's the human condition, I guess. But now, you know, I want to be with my kids. Jack is here. Okay, Jack is here. I'm leaning on them now. You know, feels like. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if things are slower. It's okay. You know, things could be slower. Something changes, you know? I'm just less of a prick. You know? You get older, you just... I don't know. I'm different. I'm different now. But then I have moments where I'm completely insane. <laughs> They push me a lot uh, because they're so smart. I want to keep up with them. And it's a great team, and they're very talented. So I have to work my ass off to keep up with this crew. Hello. <laughs> so. What are we talking about? Turned 60 last Monday. You tell me That's all. And you found that a love for the business and all, like Steve? Yeah, man, I find myself sometimes always watching women feed. You know? <laughs> always. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. How's the documentary on yourself going? My ex, my ex wife. Everybody's full of shit, right? I mean, really, at the end of the day, we're all the same. We're all doing the best we can.
Hey, Steve.